Hey, hey, how are you guys doing? Pretty good? We are in week three of our series on the crown. Summer is going by fast, but I have a question for you. What do you want to be remembered for? What do you want to be remembered for? And what would you do? How far would you go to be remembered that way? When I was in college, I uh, was recruited by two of my friends named Jacob and Riley to join their co-ed intramural indoor soccer team. And at first I thought it was an honor and a privilege to be asked until I learned about five seconds in that nobody ever passes a ball to a girl. Nobody wants the girl to be there on the court. The girl is pretty much just gonna be the goalie while the guys who are living out this weird fantasy are trying to like get called up by like the, the men's soccer team and they're just hoping and praying that one day the men's head coach will be there and see them do this really great play and get a full ride. That's what indoor soccer is when you play co-ed. And so when Jacob and Riley asked me to play, I was like, man, I got friends. They invited me to do something. And I was like, no, they're just trying to fill a quota. Because how it worked was that you had to have two girls on the field at all times. So these teams were smart. They were run by a bunch of guys and each team would only have two girls playing, they'd stick one at goalie and one at left defense because if we're being honest, nobody goes up the left side. And they'd stick them back there, they'd never pass the ball to them. But little did Jacob and Riley know that I spent a lot of my life playing soccer. From kindergarten to high school, I spent my time playing soccer. I played for travel teams. I had tournaments in Kansas City. And little did they know about me. I know I'm kind and mostly calm and mostly gentle and oddly conflict avoidant. But you put me on a rectangle and give me a ball, and I, who it doesn't matter how tall you are, it doesn't matter how big you are, I will go up against you, and I will not back down from a challenge. They didn't know that about me. And so nobody passes me the ball the first season I play with them. And I'm like, all right. I'm going to earn their trust. I'm going to be remembered as someone who is tough and someone who can hold my own, and that is what I do. They never pass me the ball, but you betcha any spare ball that was out there, I ran up and I got it. And there's people that are a lot taller than me, a lot faster than me, and I didn't care how beat up I got because I was going to prove that I had something to offer. That was my freshman year. By my senior year, I got promoted. I finally got to play midfield. This is like my best spot because I'm really great at passing the ball. It only took three years. They're all not worth it. And I remember our team was finally starting to win. They were finally starting to respect me. I think three of them now knew my name. And man, we were getting ready to go to the playoffs. But this season had been a little bit harder. You see, the people that we were playing against got a lot bigger. They got a lot taller, they got a lot more muscular because the intramural sports committee, they decided they had this rule where any college athlete, you are not allowed to play an intramural sport at all. They're like, it's too unfair. There's a lot of weak people out there and if you put a college athlete, it's just not fair. But they passed this new rule that you could play as a college athlete as long as you play a different sport than the team that you're on. And so my senior year, it's our indoor season, And for some reason, half the football team has started playing indoor soccer. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, because I'm now going up against people that are like 6'5 and over 200 pounds of pure muscle and I'm me and you know, I'm trying to go for it, but it's getting, oh, it's getting risky. And I am just getting like shoved into walls and football players know nothing about what a foul is. They think they can just push you and shove you. And the refs that coach these games, they don't call anything. And if you're a girl and you get pushed down to the floor, you better just get back up and act like it didn't hurt because your team's gonna lose respect if you like sit there and cry. And so game after game, I am just getting pummeled. But the day comes for the first playoff game, late April two weeks before graduation, and it was oddly warm enough that I could wear shorts. And it was like the first day I've worn shorts all season, and I, and I go to my classes, and I have some professors pull me aside, because after playing these games, just on one leg, I had 13 bruises. <laughs> and they're like, Emily, are you okay? Is your living situation okay? Like, <laughs> no, seriously, are you okay? I'm like, oh yeah, I'm good. I'm just playing intramural sports. I just bruise easily, it's all good. And I go throughout the rest of the day, and I see one of my friends, and he's like, Emily, you do not look good. I'm like, oh no, it's good, like I was just playing intramural sports, I'm just really tough, it's all fine. He goes, no, like, you actually should stop playing. I said, but I can't, my team is counting, they're not, they're not not counting on me, but I thought they were. (laughs) 
<laughs> it was like, we have the playoffs tonight. Like we barely have ever won. And I was like, I have to play. And he goes, Emily, I don't think you should play tonight. I think you're gonna get hurt. And I said, no, I'm playing tonight. And he goes, okay, fine. Well, don't call me when you get hurt. And I said, that's not gonna happen. All right, so I show up to this game and my team, we're somehow managing to win. And we got our hopes up because we're about to go to the semifinals. And there is 15 minutes left in the second half. And guys, it's like all of time stopped because it was my moment. You see, someone on the opposing team had a really terrible pass and I was in the midfield and it's just me, a ball, a really, really large defender and a wide open goal. And I'm just like, God, you are so good. Like, this is my moment to shine. And so I'm getting ready and I'm like full speed ahead on this ball. It doesn't matter that this guy is 6'5". It doesn't matter that he plays football. I'm gonna give him a run for his money. And so I show up there, but we hit the ball at the same time. My leg collides into his leg. My knee goes that way. My body goes this way and I'm just on the ground of a cold gym floor and everybody's looking at me and it's just really awkward and I don't know what to do because I'm like, they're gonna judge me if I do this. I'm like, if I cry, I will never hear the end of this. I will be the girl that cried. I'll be remembered for being weak. I can't do this. And I was like, no, I will not be remembered this way. And so for the next 15 minutes, I play and I make sure that nobody knows that I'm hurt and I play my heart out and we win and we're gonna go to the semifinals. And then I realize, oh, so that's what shock is. That's what adrenaline does to your body because I can barely walk back to my dorm. I wake up the next day, my knee is just a wreck. I end up having to go to the health clinic. The health clinic is like, dude, you like destroyed your knee. I end up going to like an orthopedic sports person and they're like, yeah, so when you collided with that, with that person, you dislocated your meniscus and in that process you partially tore it and then you kept running on it. And I said, yeah, cause I am tough. That is not what they thought. But what do you wanna be remembered for? What would you do to get there? I would do anything to be remembered as someone who is tough because we all know I'm not super tough. But that's what I was willing to do. I was willing to like completely injure my knee to be remembered by people who didn't even know my name. And tonight we're looking in a new book. We're continuing our story of the Kings, but we're, we're journeying through the book of Kings now. And it's story after story, account after account of this guy writing what the kings are remembered for. The good things they did, the bad things they did. It's just stories of how they are remembered. And this book opens up with the death of David. We talked about David last week, how he was someone who had a heart for the Lord. And, and even though he, he failed sometimes, he always got back up and repented. And that was part of why he is known as someone who worshiped God so well. And so David is on his deathbed and he is about to choose his son Solomon to take his place. But Solomon is in his early 20s at this point. So imagine, imagine someone comes up to you and they say, all right, you're gonna be, you're gonna be the king or the queen of Israel at your age. And at first it'd be like, dude, that's so cool. That'd be awesome. But then it's like, all right, I know nothing about foreign policy. I know nothing about economics. I know nothing about sending people into war. There's a lot of decisions that gotta be made. It quickly, quickly becomes something that is super stressful. Like you gotta make a thousand decisions a day. All of them are not easy. I would not want this job. But David gives his son advice before he takes the throne. And in 1 Kings chapter two, this is what David tells his son to do. David says, I'm about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go, and that the Lord may keep his promise to me. If your descendants watch how they live and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and all their soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. In this moment, David boils down the job of being a king to just one day, to just one thing. Will you follow God? Will you wake up each day following God? David's boiling it down. He's like, it's not about all of the 1,000 decisions you gotta make. It's just 
about whether or not you will follow God and everything else will fall in place. Solomon's only decision as becoming the king of Israel is deciding whether or not he will follow God. And this is why we remember David so well. This is why we call him a man after God's own heart. This is why every single king in the book of Kings is often compared to David because David made the decision day by day to follow God. And by doing this, David builds this foundation. He plants this soil. He does like the hard groundwork and Solomon gets the blessing and the grace of taking over as king on soil that has already been sown. He gets to build upon the hard work of his father, David, but that also comes with having big shoes to fill, right? Like there's a lot of pressure, like Solomon feels like he has to measure up because we hold David way up here, but Solomon is now stepping into a new position. And I wonder if he feels a little bit insecure, like he might not measure up to his father, David. And in 1 Kings chapter three, we see that God actually comes to help Solomon out. We read that Solomon went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David, but I'm only a little child and I don't know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? So in this chapter, Solomon, he goes up to a place of worship and he's offering this amazing sacrifice to the Lord to prove his love and his devotion. And in response, God comes to Solomon in a dream and says, all right, what do you want? I'll give it to you. And think about all the things you could ask for, like a health insurance plan, you know, or staying on your parents' health insurance plan for a while, uh, knowing that you're gonna have a full-time job when you graduate, or maybe when, if you're a king, you probably need to think more seriously. So like an army that could destroy every other army in the nation, a bunch of wealth, maybe like in this arid climate where there's a lot of farming, just like the promise that you will never have a famine and never have a drought, but also never have a flood, like all of these things you could ask for. And Solomon says, Give me a heart that can judge between right and wrong. Isn't that beautiful? Like Solomon like has this understanding and he values the people that he's leading. Like he's like, God, I don't wanna lead them astray, but I'm also like in my early twenties, I seriously don't know what I'm doing and I need help. Give me a heart to judge between right and wrong. And God is faithful in providing this. God provides Solomon the understanding And God provides Solomon the opportunity to execute his judgment. Because what God has given Solomon is the ability to know whether something is right or wrong. And God now gives Solomon the opportunity to act upon it. And we see that wisdom isn't just knowing between right and wrong, it's putting understanding in action. It's not just enough to know it, you have to apply it. And God is faithful in both giving Solomon what he needs and the opportunities to practice it. And right after this conversation, we see Solomon's wisdom on display. All right, so I'm gonna set the scene. There are two women and one baby. Each woman is arguing that the baby is theirs. You know, classic he said, she said situation. Nobody knows who this baby actually belongs to. And so they come up to Solomon And their woman A is like, dude, this is my baby. And woman B is like, no way, that's my baby. And Solomon's trying to figure out what to do. And it seems like this impossible situation, but Solomon decides that he's going to judge their responses. So he calls for a sword and he says, all right, cut the child in half. You get half, you get half, both equal, it's all good. And the first woman says, 
No. No, just, just give the child to this other lady. No. And this other lady over here is like, yeah, yeah, give me my child, give it back to me. And Solomon practices his wisdom and he shows us his wisdom because a true mom wouldn't want to see their child split in half, right? A true mom would rather see their child go to another home than witnessing, witnessing them being split in half. And Solomon realizes with his wisdom that the first mom is the true mom and in his action, he gives the baby back to his rightful mother. Like this is the power of Solomon's brain and these are the opportunities he is being given. And soon this wisdom is quickly on display and we actually have bits and pieces of it. Solomon writes a couple books in our Bible One of them is the book of Proverbs, and some of our favorite verses are actually from him. Like Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Or Proverbs 13, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. This dude is an exploding fire hydrant, just pouring out sayings and and, and songs of ways that we can walk in wisdom and understanding of ways that we can walk on a path that leads to life instead of destruction. And we're told that in total, he spoke 3000 Proverbs his songs numbered 1,005. That's, that's wild. He spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. And from all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of this wisdom. God has gifted Solomon with something magnificent. Like that is a magnificent gift. And the way Solomon uses it points back to the character of God. It points back to the beauty of a creator. It points back to a God who is just and who provides equity to his people. Solomon is gifted with his own understanding and he is given the freedom to make his own choices. That's usually the first thing we know Solomon for. The second way we know Solomon is that he's the guy who built the temple. Now the temple was actually David's idea, but because of some sin in David's life, God said, no, you're not gonna build the temple. Your successor will build the temple. But David, out of his love for God, created all of the plans. He made all of the blueprints, designed the entire building, and told Solomon how to do all of this. And Solomon builds it. It takes seven years to complete. It will be incredibly expensive but then again, it's for the creator of the world. So it should be. And David's heart wasn't to create a space or a building where God's presence could be contained. David's heart was to create a building where Israel could go and find the presence of God. One common place where they could worship together. And after seven years, they complete this temple and they go to consecrate it and dedicate it to the Lord. And in 1 Kings chapter eight, Listen to what happens. When the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled this temple. The glory of the Lord, the weight of his holiness fills the temple and is so thick that the people of God have to seize from their ritual and just stop. Think about it. Like like if the glory of the Lord came down in such a big cloud where our musicians couldn't even see their guitar or the drums, we couldn't see the words on the screen, I couldn't see my notes, I couldn't see what time it is, like that'd be really bad. And, And we just have to stop and we just have to focus on the fact that we are in a room with the living God. That is what is happening here. And when we get to this part of Solomon's story, when we consider how he uses his wisdom, when we consider the way that God blesses something Solomon builds, we're like, man, what a guy. What a worshiper. He's just like his father, David. This isn't the whole story. And the problem with this story is that Solomon's achievements often overshadow some of the other parts of his life. His life is actually very complex and very gray, but it can be boiled down to one thing. You see, Solomon practices God plus worship. 
He practices what I call, I worship God, and all of the other 8,000 things that I love. So let's back up real quick. I'm about to retell like eight chapters of scripture right here. So we're gonna go pretty fast. So Solomon's story starts actually with a marriage to Pharaoh's daughter. So Pharaoh is the king of Egypt and Solomon is now making an alliance through marriage with Pharaoh's daughter. He is trying to secure a position for himself, not as the king of Israel, but within the entire world as being known for someone who is secure and, and, and wealthy. The problem though, is that for 400 years, Egypt prospered off the backs of Israel. Remember this story where Moses leads Israel out of slavery? Yeah, Israel was being enslaved by Egypt and for 400 years, they were not only physically laboring, but they lived in a emotional, spiritual, and mental system that told them that they were nothing. For 400 years. And this was hidden from the Egyptians because of their affluence and because of their wealth. For 400 years, this is the culture. And now Solomon, the beginning of his story is him making an alliance and a friendship with Pharaoh. Of him bringing Pharaoh's daughter into Jerusalem before a temple is built, before worship is organized. And Pharaoh's daughter's got her own religious system. She's got her own idols. She's got her own ways of practicing worship. And so you're gonna bring a woman who worships false gods and idols into a community of believers that are disorganized? That is not a good idea. Yet God in his grace comes to Solomon in a dream and says, I'll give you anything you desire. And Solomon at this point is like, yeah, I'll take some wisdom. And God gives it to him. And God is pleased with this request because it shows that Solomon cares for his, his people. And so God also gives Solomon wealth. He gives Solomon honor and he gives Solomon fame. And, and soon it, it just skyrockets. Like Israel has become so wealthy and affluent where we read that gold was so common that silver was worthless. Their stomachs are filled, they are happy, they are merry, they are just excited to be there. And they profit off of Solomon. Every appetite, every craving that they have can be fulfilled through the wealth and the power of Solomon. And then Solomon begins to prepare the temple, this beautiful place for the Lord, for the holy and living God. And he will, he will not ask and he will not pay. But he will put 30,000 people in Israel into forced labor to build the temple of a living God. 30,000 people. And they won't just build the temple, they will build cities, they will build the wall of Jerusalem. For seven years, 30,000 people being treated as property and for another 13 years, he will use 30,000 people to build his own palace. He will spend double the time, double the attention, double the detail on his own home rather than the temple of a living God. The God that comes in a cloud so thick that you have to stop and pay attention. But Solomon's gonna be over here spending 13 years building his own home and he will pray these amazing prayers after God appears and we're like, man, what a holy guy. But he is using people for free labor to build his own home and God will appear one more time to Solomon to remind him of what it means to be king. It was never about the thousands of decisions. It was always about the one. Will you worship me? Will you follow me? Will you obey my commands? And it's this moment where we feel like Solomon might change. He might get it. And then we find out that throughout this whole entire time, Solomon has been making more than one marriage alliance. He's actually made 300. So he has 300 wives, 300 wives, and uh, this is, yeah, and 700 concubines. This man has 1,000 women. That's, whew, he has 1,000 women. But guess what? Most of these women, do they worship God? No, no, all right? But you know the saying, happy wife, happy life, you know? He's made all of these alliances with different countries. And what happens if your daughter tells your, like, what happens if you're a daughter and you tell your dad, you're like, dad, my husband is not great. Do you know what's gonna happen? You, you don't know what, 
you don't want to know what's going to happen, right? And so Solomon is like, I, I can't have these people finding out I treat my wives terribly. So what does he do? He helps them build altars and shrines to their false gods. Whoa, front row got it. <laughs> the man who builds the temple of the living God will now help 1,000 women build altars and shrines to worthless idols. The story of Solomon is that he practices God plus worship. His political oppression is hidden behind financial prosperity. His unstable character is hidden behind his wisdom and his idolatry is hidden behind the temple. And what Solomon teaches us right now is that idols are not just things that we create with our hands and set on a shelf, but they are things that we value. They are things that we try and receive life from. And Solomon shows us that how we choose to worship and what we choose to worship changes us. And this is the beauty of what happens here at Oasis. Because we believe that when we worship a living God, that that God is slowly transforming us into his image. He is leading us along the right paths. But guess what? This happens when you worship the wrong thing too. We are always being formed into an image of something and Solomon's worship reveals that he is slowly and slowly becoming what he worships. And if you don't believe me, then why is America one of the most nutritionally impoverished like, countries in the entire world, entire world? It's not because we lack nutritional food, it's because we fill our stomach instead of filling our soul. If you don't believe me, then why is our generation known more for the mental health crisis we're in rather than all of the beautiful contributions we have made to society? It's not because you're stressed. It's not because you're in school. It is not because of work. It is because we pull out our phone every single day and we find our identity and our worth and our purpose on a screen. If you don't believe me, then why is it when I live two blocks from downtown on a Saturday night, I wake up in the middle of the night to drunk and hungover people walking around my house? It's not because they had a stressful day. It's because of their worship. It's because they're trying to numb the pain they feel when their idols don't deliver satisfaction. Our generation struggles with feeling empty because we worship empty things and empty people. Our generation is tired and burnt out because it's like we're performing CPR, like really aggressive chest compressions all the time on things that don't deliver. And as soon as we recognize this isn't delivering, we go and we find a new one and we try that one out for a while. And this one isn't giving me life. Our generation is breathing life into things that are dead. And we feel empty when they don't provide for us. Our generation forgets that we have a God who is living, a God who overcomes death, a God who a grave can't contain, but we would rather turn to things and try and breathe life into them in order for us to feel good. And if this isn't the worst part, these altars and these shrines, they will stay in Israel for over 200 years. For over 200 years, the people of God will be worshiping fake gods idols that are worthless. They will be led astray for over 200 years. Solomon's decisions will be changing the eternity of generations and generations of people. For over 200 years, there are people who are going to be lost, people who are led astray. And this week, this just, oh man, this got me, this got me frustrated. This got me angry, it had me sad, it had me grieving because there are generations and generations of people that are forever lost. How we choose to worship and what we choose to worship matters. And I think we just need to sit here for a second. I think we need to feel the grief, to feel the depravity. Generations and generations of people are changed by the legacies we leave behind in our worship. And this week I got frustrated because I was like, God, I know in your word that there are people who do it right. Like you got Moses. 
He worshiped you and he led people out of slavery to worship you. Like you got David, he creates this amazing foundation. You have people like Paul, like we're here because of the legacy of Paul and how he built the church. But I was like, God, is it even possible to live a life, a life of worship, a life that changes people? Is it even possible to make decisions that can change someone else's eternity? And God gracefully reminded me of my grandma. My grandma's name is Mildred McCright. Um, I think this is, I have a photo of her. Yeah, that's my grandma, that's me, kind of cute. Um, we called her Gigi, you know, great grandma, but she didn't really catch on that it stood for great grandma. She thought we were just like renaming her and so she would sign every card G-E-E-G-E-E-G-G. -E -E -G -G. That was my grandma, but she, she was born in 1919 in a, in a farm town in Kansas. She had, like, was forced to grow up strong and resilient because after 1919, you're gonna hit the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. And I do not wanna live on a farm during the Dust Bowl. And we just remembered her for being strong and for being resilient. She lived to be 100 years old. And so when I was in college, she passed. And I remember going to her funeral. And a lot of times people would come up to our family and tell us all of these stories about how she was stubborn, about how she was strong, how she was resilient. But they would always use this one word to describe her. And it was the word matriarch. And they weren't saying like, men shouldn't lead. They were saying that she led her family with spiritual authority. And my family, we just kind of got to reflect on the influence that she had in our lives. Cause let me break it down to you. Gigi and her husband, Kenny, they loved Jesus. And they had two daughters, my great aunt and my grandma, and they taught them to love Jesus. And then my grandma had my mom and my aunt, and, and they taught them to love Jesus. And my mom marries my dad, and my, my parents have me and my brother, and they taught us to love Jesus. And I have aunts, and I have uncles, and I have cousins, and people in our lives that are changed because one person chose to wake up every single day and make one decision. Will I worship God today? Six months after her funeral, I started working at a pool as a lifeguard. And I started working with this CNA named Sydney and Sydney didn't follow Jesus, but I was talking to her one day and I was like, hey, where do you work? She's like, I work at this nursing home. It's like, no way. My grandma spent the last three months of her life at that nursing home. We realized that Sydney never met my grandma. She had worked after my grandma had passed. But what Sydney told me was that people were still talking about Gigi. Like people were still talking about how much they loved being around her. And the one thing I know about my grandma is that she never stopped talking about Jesus. Like every single day, she's just like, I wanna go. I don't know why I'm here. I just wanna be with the Lord. And I remember this conversation and I was just like, man, all those times where grandma told us that she just didn't wanna be here. And like, grandma, you have a purpose. You have people you can lead. And I have this guard I'm sitting next to who has never met Gigi but who had seeds planted because of my grandma, because of the choices that she made. Just, just as Solomon's worship led to generations and generations of people being lost, the worship of my grandma is gonna lead to generations and generations of people being saved. Even people that she never even met, people she never even knew. Our worship here matters because our worship is going to change generations and generations of people who are lost, generations and generations of people you may never meet, but by the power of God's spirit, he is going to use it to change you and to change people. The question is when you leave here tonight, will you worship God? When you wake up tomorrow morning, will you worship God? You guys pray with me.